Hi, I'm Brent Stafford, and this is Red Watch by RegulatorWatch.com. Hysteria over vaping-related lung illness appeared out of nowhere in a flash, consumed the entire North American vaping industry. It began on August 16th with a short media statement issued by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, and by September 11th, it had metastasized into a presidential vaping ban. Canada was not immune. The following week, Dr. Christopher Mackey, medical officer for the Middlesex London region in Ontario, held a gripping news conference to announce the first confirmed case of vaping-related lung illness in Canada. As was the case in the U.S., although with more bravado, Dr. Mackey slow-walked the release of critical information regarding the suspect substance, whether it was THC or a nicotine vaping product, and then refused to disclose the brand name of the product involved. Did U.S. and Canadian health officials withhold information that could have protected the public from further exposure, illness, or even death? Joining us today to help us answer those questions is Dr. Mark Tyndall. Dr. Tyndall is a physician and North American expert on infectious disease. He is the former head of the BC Center for Disease Control, and he's a professor of medicine at the UBC School of Population and Public Health. Dr. Tyndall, thanks for joining us again on RegWatch. Hi, Brent. So the last time you were here on the show, it was the final episode before we packed it up and headed to Ottawa for RegWatch's exclusive interview with James Van Loon, the Director General of the Tobacco Control Directorate at Health Canada. So Dr. Tyndall, the title of that episode that we did was Moral Panic, Diagnosing the Youth Vaping Epidemic. It's now six months later. What's your prognosis on the moral panic over vaping today? Well, I guess it's accelerated quite a bit um, as far as media attention to this problem um, based on all of that illness that's been reported in the United States. So uh, clearly those six months have uh, really elevated the media attention and uh, and really elevated some you know major concerns around uh, what's happening to youth and their use of uh, vaping and other things. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's definitely been, uh, there's other things involved, no doubt. Uh, there's going to be some viewers of ours that uh, may not know who you are. Could you please share your expertise? And, and I just briefly mentioned, you know, you're the head of the BCCDC. You've got a wide range of background here that really can impact our discussion today. Please fill our audience in. Well, I'm surprised there'd be people who wouldn't know who I am, Brent, but... Uh... <laughs> so, um, so really my uh, background is uh, in infectious diseases and um, harm reduction. So my interest in uh, tobacco harm reduction really uh, is based on the work I've done in harm reduction uh, for what would be considered more serious drugs like heroin and cocaine. So I've, I've worked in the infamous downtown east side of Vancouver for about 20 years and uh, have been involved in supervised injection sites, needle exchanges, and, uh, and those kind of things. But I, I think I may have mentioned before, but um, ironic, the reason I'm doing, the uh, reason I really took an interest in vaping is because I've been following large numbers of people using drugs for, uh, for 20 years. And um, HIV and hepatitis C, which got me into this, uh, are we have some really uh, effective ways to deal with that now. And when I've been following cohorts, uh, tobacco-related illness by far is what's killing uh, people that I'm following. So th this is especially a, um, a serious issue amongst uh, more marginalized people in our society who tend to be most likely to smoke. So I've came upon this uh, really because I want to be an advocate for people who uh, really need access to a safer product than, uh, than burning cigarettes. Yeah, and that really does beg the question. A, a lot of people miss the fact that there is a, a social justice issue when it comes to class and race when it comes to using tobacco. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, people that are um, into the um, tobacco cessation and uh, to people trying to help people quit. Um, the population that I'm dealing with is uh, basically forgotten. We just uh, assume everybody smokes their two packs a day. And um, really, there's n been very little effort to offer people any alternatives. And we just assume that that's what they're going to do. And uh, it's quite remarkable, as I say, when we know that how many people uh, 
who live on the margin smoke cigarettes and they're all dying early because of this habit. So uh, I have to do this. I actually, I, I, I kind of like doing this. So for our audience, just so they understand, you're a doctor doctor. Uh, I do have a, a doctoral degree in epidemiology as well as my medical doctor, yes. So, so perfect. So I, best of both worlds, actually, when it comes to it. So, all right. Or worse of both worlds. Or worse of both worlds, exactly. Well, let me ask you that. Okay, so which side of the coin, because, you know, obviously we don't need to get into too much of setting the stage, but all hell is broken loose when it comes to vaping. I mean, there's the, the standards of truth seem to be gone. The bans are happening. I mean, we'll, we'll walk through some of the timelines here. But before we do that, just knowing what's happened, um, obviously the medical side of things, there's an issue there. So epidemiology or physicians, where's the biggest problem lie, do you think, between those two? Because that, those are good two to contrast. Yeah, I mean, I've drifted more into population health and public health. So looking more at health policies that affect way more people than the sort of one-on-one -on -one in interaction that physicians deal with. I, I do understand from a you know, physician's perspective that uh, if they feel there's other things they can offer people to uh, reduce or get them to quit smoking, then they, they should do that. But there seems to be little, uh, a, little, uh, a little reluctance to, um, um, you know, admitting that what we have to offer people right now is quite limited. And uh, tobacco is very fascinating in that most people who currently smoke would like not to smoke. And yet, with uh, you know patches and gums and inhalers, it's just really limited how how many people are able to uh, to stop. So, if we you know that whole group uh, physicians should be looking for any tool that could make things safer for uh, for people. And unfortunately, we're still uh, locked in this idea that we don't know if they're safer when um, you know if you take all the deadly chemicals out of a product. Um, clearly it's going to be safer. So the, the one fascinating thing we know about uh, all our experience with tobacco is the actual toxins and substances that uh, create disease in people. And if you have a product that takes essentially all of them out, it's pretty ridiculous to keep arguing that, well, we really don't know if, uh, if this would be safer or not. Of course it's safer. And uh, we, we're kind of stuck think, having this argument when that should be long behind us, that getting your nicotine through e-cigarettes is way safer than burning combustible tobacco, full stop. And then we're on to how we uh, you know, safely roll this out and regulate it and get people uh, as much access as possible. You just said roll it out, right? Uh, the thing that's happening mm -hmm. indeed is actually a rolling back. That seems to be the yeah. actual target of the policymakers right now. I, I don't see, there's, there, do you actually think that there's still some kind of you know, blue sky out there for vaping? Uh -huh. Well, I think we've taken a real step backwards So uh, in the last while. I think what makes vaping quite interesting is that it really was a grassroots effort and people who actually cared about uh, their health and wanted to uh, get a safer product were really behind moving this along. And so uh, it wasn't, the product wasn't introduced like normal pharmaceutical or medical appliances where uh, to get approval, you had to show, you know, uh, very rigorous scientific evidence. And um, it just rolled out very quickly by uh, popular demand. And again, another misconception somehow is that, you know, big tobacco is all behind this and they just, uh, you know, it, it's just a way to uh, increase their, their market share and extend nicotine addiction where that's certainly not where it started. And clearly a lot of the big movers now are tobacco com back companies, but that's not where it started. And part of the, uh, it, to me, another fascinating thing about that is that if it's run by big tobacco, they don't care that much. Their current business model is quite effective. They're, they sell a lot of products and they make a lot of profit. And uh, I don't think they were ever in any big hurry to uh, 
you know, push vaping along. It's a disruptive technology to them, and uh, probably they uh, tend, they will lose money on this if uh, if everybody you know, stops smoking their cigarettes. So it's a bit of a conflicted how serious big tobacco is to move everybody off smoking onto vaping. I think they try to get ahead of it so they can still make profit on this. But uh, at the end of the day, um, if vaping kind of stalls out, um, the default is business as usual. And uh, that's quite uh, quite okay for tobacco companies. And that does seem to be actually something that's kind of saved the tobacco companies. But, you know, over the years, regulation can get threatened and can start moving in. And if they kind of hold regulation back and stuff like that, well, it's just another year of selling their cigarettes, right? So, and I'm, I'm not beating up. Look, I, I smoke for 25 years. I'm not one of those people that uh, has this big, huge, grand hatred for big tobacco. You know, I'm a libertarian, more conservative libertarian at heart. And so I'm a big boy. I knew what I was smoking. I don't blame uh, uh, some company for getting me addicted. And that's why I've got a real problem with what is kind of happening in this whole construction around Juul, because the big word that's missing from the entire conversation is responsibility. If 5%, even even 2%, of all of the billions and billions of dollars of media hype that's gone to uh, promote Jewel basically as the next cool greatest thing and then to admonish Jewel for being the next cool greatest thing and then drag everybody else that's in the vaping industry along for a massive toboggan ride that's crashing them into a tree. If just a couple percentage of that was spent on admonishing the kids for uh, using these products, and admonishing the parents and maybe attaching just a little bit of shame on the parents and on the kids. I mean, that's what our society used to do. And we used to be able to manage these things a little bit better. Yeah, no, it is interesting how the focus of the media is that the kids are uh, just helpless victims and all this stuff. And that uh, that's mean, mean big company has kind of uh, given their products to them. I mean, I mean, there is... I, and the, the fascinating thing with the you know uh, teens and their activities, there's a whole list of things that, uh, as a society, we would admonish them and we we say that what they're doing is not uh, not what we approve of: alcohol, cannabis, sex, all these kind of things that you know even video games that you know teenagers aren't supposed to be doing. Um, and this is just the the next thing that we've decided, but somehow we. We haven't blamed it on them. It's uh, we really blamed it on uh, uh, on advertising and uh, yeah, and lack of regulation. Mm, yes. Uh, well, I could get into the philo- philosophical aspects about that, but yeah. if everybody's born good, it always has to be the social institutions or ignorance that make people go bad, right? The kid can never be bad themselves. Mm-hmm. It always has to be the external, otherwise the whole ideology falls apart. So, <laughs> but. We, we shall hold it there. So I'm going to jump over here, Mark, uh, to um, our computer. And I've got up there, and let me just switch you over. Just let me know if you can't see it whenever I say to you that I'm sending it to you. So we're just on RegWatch right now. And for those of you who are not used, yet used to our live shows, just be thankful that we're actually on and you can hear us. So that's the first thing. Number two is that they're a little bit loosey-goosey, obviously way loosier than um, our uh, professionally produced, you know, uh, Uh, 15 minute 20 minute pieces so we've got thankfully mark here for about an hour and we're going to wind our way through a bit of this story now the first part of this story that i think that's so interesting and it's crazy i i did it in my lead which was i let's not discount the fact that in less than 30 days we went from the very first statement from cdc to a presidential vaping ban in less than 30 days Name something, anything besides going to war. And even war, you can't even go to war that fast. I mean, they dropped bombs on Pearl Harbor. It still took months and months for them to get uh, across the ocean and do the first bombing in Japan. There's just no way that it's like 25 days. Come on, are you kidding? Like, oh, and then in Canada, I'm just going to rant for a sec. In Canada, and like no offense to anybody that's close by here, but, you know, um, 
you know, top top the health officials in British Columbia were already saying two weeks before Dr. Mackey made his announcement in Ontario, there was already stories in CBC and Global News saying that it's only a matter of time before these illnesses come here to British Columbia and Canada. The, the, the sense in which that tone happened, I am going to throw this actually at you before I, we do this. Dr. Tyndall, I sensed a very distinct level of glee. There's, there's almost glee. Uh, well, I think in the, uh, the general public health community, there is still uh, a lot of debate about uh, where e-cigarettes belong. Um, I think the, there's people who are on the harm reduction side of it, as I clearly am, and there's people that feel they're uh, just another way to addict people and they, um, they're not proven to be safer. So that debate still continues, and I think that... Um, obviously, people who uh, feel that they are, you know, that they're not a good thing, um, are uh, looking for, you know, more evidence to prove their their point that uh, these are potentially very dangerous to the to society. And and then it happened. I mean, from a public health, when you think about um, when things happen that are, um, you know, unexpected or uh, new uh, a new diseases or outbreaks. Uh, we are. We tend to be very proactive on these things. I mean, um, you know, a couple of months ago, one person in British Columbia died of rabies, and that was all over the newspaper. It was a very unusual case, but um, public health tried to be way out in front of it, and uh, they felt an obligation, and we felt an obligation that uh, people had to be aware that you know there was a human case of rabies that died in British Columbia, and it just one case, and um, you know it, it, it got a lot of uh, attention. The uh, you know, if somebody gets a infection fr from an a GI infection from an oyster, or there's an outbreak in cheese. I mean, we're often uh, public health is quite ahead of this. We have a very precautionary principle that public health generally follows that uh, we have to get that information out there to give people a chance if things, uh, you know, because you can never uh, never backtrack. So if, let's say um, you know the next week, uh, ten people died of rabies. Um, then it, people would be really questioning why we why everybody wasn't informed. So it's a it's quite a precautionary uh, approach that we generally take to public health because um, nobody wants to be caught out um, at the beginning of an outbreak and not raise the alarm and not do everything possible to uh, you know give people the information that they need. So I, I don't I, I think that people who um, are not supportive of uh, e-cigarettes and vaping on the whole. Um, Again, clearly, this gives them more ammunition for their uh, their stance. Um, but I, I don't know if I'd go so far as say it's glee. But uh, they there is somewhat of a I told you so that this would go very bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you're being polite, I think, but fair enough. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, so here's the thing: you just mentioned the fact about informing the public. And so we'll just walk through a couple of these links to kind of track through it. So CDC sends out their, their uh, health alert on August 30th. And inside, you know, their alert, which is asking, and you know very well, and, and as soon as I tee this up, I'm handing it back to you to talk about the actual process because you know it from, you know, running a, a Centers for Disease Control. You've got um, CDC uh, putting out their, their advisory, their health advisory. And, you know, it's just all it is is e-cigarettes and vaping you know uh, it's even talking right here it's talking about ends like general background there's no thc in here at all already by august 30th there was you know some understanding that this was probably to you know illicit thc products um things broke on the 23rd of august and that's when cbs did their big piece and they had their cdc chiron and the big huge you know graphic saying they don't know the brand they don't know the substance they don't know um anything about it at all but yet it's vaping and e-cigarettes and it's burning down the house right and so this comes out on august 30th and again so the entire warning to and and ask to every single physician and and, and medical person across the country now, see, here's a finally a little bit on THC. It's like way down below, but it's still with inside the e-cigarette product, uh, you know, milieu here. And CDC has never once referred to uh, THC product as e-cigarettes until they are confounding, you know, this together. So this brings us to our, our topic of our show, which is, you know, false pretext. So here, here's this pretext 
that these lung il illnesses pop up that are THC, illicit THC related, and it immediately pops up into their system. And instead of handling it in a way that they should, at least it's our opinion, and that of many others, they have conflated it into e-cigarette products and vaping. They push that out in the media 25 days later it's full national ban. So that's that's where we're at. What the key thing I want to mention here is in is in their ask is they don't ask for urine samples or blood samples. So basically they want just self-reporting from the alleged patients in these cases uh, mm -hmm. on the substance and it's those self-reports is what they used um, to then for lack of the better word nail vaping's hide to the wall. So Explain to our viewers in the province of British Columbia, so that's like a whole state, right? You're the mm -hmm. top dog that, you know, at a Centers for Disease Control. Fill us in about the professional aspect in which this was handled and, and how that might have been different if you were in charge. Yeah. Well, I, I think when a signal or something happens, if there's a, I think a, a sick teenager is quite a alarming thing for people. A, a healthy person comes in with a lung disease that could kill them. Um, I think we want to get to the, as much information, get to the bottom of it as possible and as quickly as possible and give people the most specific information they can. What's kind of crazy about um, something like nicotine addiction, just to give this blanket statement that the only thing we can tell you is that to stop all uh, vaping and e-cigarettes, when at the same time we're saying that this is, a tra this is a catastrophe because all these people are now addicted to nicotine and can't stop, um, what do we expect people to do? Like, it, and the only thing really they can do is start smoking cigarettes, because which is uh, exactly what we don't want them to do. So it's a, it, you know, to not um, not really give more specific information and just make some blanket statement. Um, you know, if for instance, if there was somebody who got very sick from uh, from eating cheese. Um, we wouldn't say we would find out right away what kind of cheese and where it was purchased from and don't buy that cheese or throw away that. We wouldn't say to the whole province, don't eat cheese anymore. Um, I mean, even that would be more uh, doable than don't smoke anymore because <laughs> people can't. I guess they could choose not to eat that cheese. But our role in public health is to give people the most uh, specific and uh reasonable information just you know there's a car accident and somebody dies we don't don't drive your car anymore for a week until we figure out what happened um so so i do think that cdc and what happened in ontario what happened in ontario um should have moved quicker as far as uh getting some more specifics out there and uh and by not telling uh people that uh thc was involved it it, it almost implies that uh it's okay to it, maybe some kids decided, well, I, I better not use nicotine e-cigarettes anymore, but uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm fine with using my THC oil. So it's, uh, it can, uh, you know, go in the opposite direction. And it's possible with uh, that, those vague uh, recommendations that uh, they could have, you know, caused some people to use dangerous, uh, dangerous um, pods or wherever they got them from. So the other and the other fascinating thing is that um, with the self report, especially in uh, places where uh, cannabis is illegal, then uh, it's going to be pretty hard to get that information from people. So uh, if you're, you know, you're asked by your doctor or, or you know, would you um, did you use um, nicotine vapes or did you use THC? Uh, people would be much more uh, uh, much more open to saying, oh, that's, uh, yeah, I was just using nicotine because they're, they're technically legal and uh, THC isn't. So uh, it may have, uh, you know, um, uh, slowed the process down quite a bit if it's just self-report like that. So, I mean, to my seasoned uh, ears and eyes and brain, I, I just can't see how that's not purposeful because – their whole entire job, the CDC, is to find the very specific things that are causing illness because it's an outbreak, right? Yeah. Yeah. And um, I think, too, that what one fascinating map I saw that the cases uh, weren't didn't overlap with the most uh, uh, high prevalence of youth vaping. So uh, it did it didn't correspond. You would think if it was just uh, 
that, you know, using Juul, for instance, uh, led to acute lung injury. The states with the most uh, Juul use would also have the most cases, and that just didn't happen. Um, and the other peculiar thing is it, this, uh, um, you know, uh, uptick and, um, you know, really a large number of people exposing themselves to, to vaping among youth populations. Um, why would it happen now? So if it was a, a acute injury that people were developing, um, we, we wouldn't have had, you know, three, three or four years of high prevalence of vaping among youth. And then all of a sudden in uh, 2019, we get this terrible outbreak. So it really, from an investigative point of view from public health, I think those would be the questions. What changed? Like, clearly, it makes no sense that kids were using vape for, you know, we using jewels for three years. And all of a sudden now everybody's getting acute lung injury from doing that. It doesn't make any sense. Something had to change. And another uh, and the most likely thing, there was a contaminant or an illicit product that came into the uh, into the scene. Right. And I mean, and there definitely was reporting on that that was going on. Leafly, which does a great job of investigative reporting on the cannabis side, the cannabis industry, uh, News and they had they had a very in depth piece out I think around September sixth if not maybe a couple of days earlier but around right around that time where they fully identified the whole vitamin E uh, they identified different brands that are involved in making the the you know the cutting agent or thickening agent and all of that so I mean it, it's not like that this information uh, wasn't out there and it literally was just this weekend on the 26th that the CDC finally acquiesced uh, to admit that it was actually THC that was the strongest, uh, the most number. I'm gonna just switch us back over here again, Mark, and turning over here. So the, um, let me just grab the link here. It's this one right here. So this was, this is very, very interesting. So this is September 27th, and this release is the mea culpa. Right. So what is already known about this topic? Well, lung injury associated with e-cigarette use or vaping has recently been reported in most states. CDC, the Food and Drug Administration and others are investigating this outbreak. <laughs> so what is added in this report? Well, among the 805 cases reported as of September 24, 2019, 69% were males, 62% of patients were aged 18 to 34 years old. Among, a pa among patients with data on substances used in e-cigarettes or vaping products, THC-containing product use was reported by 77%. And so 36% reported exclusive THC use. This is, a re this is an admission from the CDC they refused to make from their very first August 16th, August 23rd, August 30th, and then every step in between, it took until September 27th for them to finally acquiesce that. And of course, this whole time, every single news report that was out there was e-cigarettes and vaping. If they mentioned THC, it was an incidental mention, right? The, 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 yeah. the smear was on regular vaping products, period. Yeah. And uh, those 76 percent or whatever, as I say, um, youth would be reluctant to admit they were using it. And in some cases, if they got from a, a street source or a bootleg source, they might even not know when they were using it. I mean, it, it's you know, it's uh, it's uh, probably very um, under underreported. And I, I would think that, you know, there's no evidence that anybody who was using commercial nicotine containing products developed this lung disease. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. The other, the pathology of it is, um, you know, from what I've read is this lipoid pneumonia, which is really an allergic reaction to the lungs when they're exposed to, to oils. So uh, it's, uh, you know, it's well, it's well described with other uh, lung injuries and exposures like that, the, the specific type of pneumonia. So I would think that, you know, if, if we could get the, um, you know, the actual uh, vape from everybody that got sick, uh, there'd be probably no one who uh, got sick just from using Juul or uh, other uh, nicotine containing vape products. But yet, it's this very issue that is collapsing the vaping industry. Yeah, no, I think it's um, it, it is a it is a really a misdirection here. So uh, and the uh, 
um, as you say, I think it, is, it has been used um, by uh, people concerned with youth vaping. And I think we, you know, we need to be very open that, uh, you know, 20 percent of uh, high school students uh, uh, trying vape is not what we'd uh, be suggesting or recommending for people. Um, you know, we have to take that from, uh, you know, it's not that 20 percent of high school students are now addicted to nicotine. These are mostly questionnaires. Have you tried it in the last 30 days kind of thing? But there will be a proportion of youth who uh, use them regularly and will develop an addiction to nicotine. There's no uh, no denying that. Um, and so it's something that we uh, that we need to uh, seriously consider because I don't think any of us want that. So um the uh, we need to uh, be smart and regulated, but uh, certainly banning's no way no way to do it. So it's all about education and making sure people realize what they're getting themselves into, um, not using scare tactics, but just uh, just good information. And uh, the worst thing that can happen though now if we take uh, this this group of young people who had been using uh, vape regularly and do have um, a dependency now on nicotine that we pull the rug from under their feet and say, well, we're, we're not allowing you to get these anymore. Um, and the default will be cigarette smoking, which would be a that's the real disaster. <laughs> right. True. Uh, Truth Initiative in the U.S. and FDA over the summer was holding, you know, hearings and sessions and stuff like that to see about whether or not they should be putting teens on Chantex. So, OK, yeah. they can't vape a jewel to help them get off. We're going to give them mind altering drugs. Yeah. No, I, I find that uh, pretty. Uh, yeah, that would be pretty crazy. <laughs> Yeah. So you know, you work around this. Like, I mean, is this is this true? I mean, these these are adults. Have they gone nuts? Well, I think you'd find in most responses when uh, young people are involved, there's a, a real um, you know move to protect, and we don't care as much about people who already are impacted by this. So uh, it's. Uh, you know, I think you could ask a public health official, what is the trade off if, uh, you know, um, you know, 10 kids got addicted to nicotine and uh, a thousand adults were able to quit smoking? Is that a reasonable trade off? Like, I mean, and I think a lot of public health pe people would uh, err on the side. Well, of course, we don't want 10 kids getting addicted to nicotine <laughs> and uh, those thousand smokers. I mean, they should just stop. Like that's kind of that. I think that would be a common calculation. Um, so people are not, you know, maybe willing to risk any fallout um, of nicotine addiction among youth due to vaping. Um, it, it, they won't. They won't tolerate one of those cases. Um, it, and they would uh, rather um, just ban the whole thing. Yeah. Um, when there's, you know, in Canada, there's five million estimated five million people killing themselves every day by smoking combustible tobacco, and I. That's where I, you know, that's my, uh, you know, my advocacy that it's just um, unconscionable that we would be lying to people and not giving them the option. They, the people who are concerned about their health uh, should be um, encouraged to try a safer product. And it uh, doesn't mean we didn't regulate it. It doesn't mean that we can't come up with ways to discourage youth from taking it up. Uh, but they shouldn't be mutually exclusive and uh, just a knee jerk reaction that you know, pretend that e-cigarettes were never invented is uh, is a huge loss to uh, to public health. So you just said lying to the public. Do you believe that's actually what happened here in this case? Public health has been lying to the public. Well, I I, I think you know that what you just showed, uh, not uh, trying to give the specifics and just making this blanket statements about uh, people just just stop vaping until we sort this out. Um, is ridiculous on one hand because uh, people can't stop vaping and they can't, you know, so they're they're using nicotine. So it wasn't going to happen. It, it, as I say, it's not like a lettuce or cheese outbreak where uh, just give us a week and we'll figure this out. And in the meantime, don't expose yourself because uh, we knew people would continue to expose themselves and really would have no reasonable thing other than to start smoking cigarettes, which we don't want them to do. Yeah, it's un it's unbelievable because, you know, it's a very addictive drug. Uh, it comes in a form that uh, has been sold to Western societies for about 100 years now and promoted like crazy. And so for the longest time, 
right? It was okay to smoke. And then it took decades and decades for kind of really hammer hammer down the smoking rate. But still, nevertheless, you've got all these people that were smokers or the, like the last of the gr- of the main group. You know, there's still some people, but there's this huge mm-hmm. cohort that did actually quit using vaping and they feel like they did everything they were asked to do. They were just completely now beat up by tobacco control and, you know, they created vaping and they created a huge industry around it, billions of dollar industry. It's moved all around the world. There's taste cultures that go with it. There's communities wrapped around it and tons of local businesses. In the US, it's like the largest and fastest uh, and most diverse um, business sector in all of the business sectors in the United States of America. And yet they could get closed because of this lie. It is a lie that has happened. Let's move over to um, Toronto, uh, sorry, London Middlesex here. And le- okay, and it, here it is. And let me switch you over. And so I'm hoping that everybody's gonna hear this okay. Now, I, I wanna make sure we get to this before we get too late in the show. This is uh, Dr. Chris Mackey. Um, this is on September 18th, which was the big f- announcement regarding Canada's first. I heard there might have been one before that in Quebec, but I I don't know much about that. So this is the English Canada first. And I just wanted to play about two minutes of, uh, of this. Sorry if I missed this because we just got here. We know in the U.S. this illness has been associated with actually uh, cannabis, and or at least that's the idea so far that it's cannabis vaping, and that it's cannabis bought not at a shop but in an online way, maybe something that's less less well known than a jewel, for example. Do we know yet where where she got the product that she was using, and if it was cannabis or so uh, thanks for the question uh, the question is about cannabis we won't be commenting on that uh, in this situation in order to protect patient confidentiality uh, I notice you're using a gendered pronoun I hope that's not because we that's have because uh, I just got in here and okay no problem uh, we're not releasing the gender at this point uh, and so uh, I think that's part of the question you're not willing to say whether it's cannabis or not at this point. So we have information about the brand used. We have information about the wind, whether or not the individual was using cannabis. Uh, the, the information that we have from looking across the whole spectrum of illness related to vaping is that there's no particular brand that has been implicated and there's no uh, particular link uh, with cannabis or not. There are cases where cannabis has involved and cases where it hasn't been. So uh, in order to uh, clarify the, the health messaging, uh, we're not gonna be releasing the brand related information uh, because that help, that would imply that this is something coming from one brand when clearly looking at the international evidence, that's not the case. But if, yeah. but if it is the one brand that is related to this, then wouldn't you wanna protect people from that one brand in this specific case? Absolutely, and that's why the information has been passed to the Office of the Chief Medical Officer of Health, who will be gathering systematic data about uh, all of these cases and what brands might be implicated. Nick, Doctor, uh, Nick Paparella from CTV. Uh, in regards to this young person, uh, you mentioned that uh, he or she was on life support. I mean, what's the prognosis? What's I mean, does he or she require a lung transplant? How severe and how serious was this uh, injury? So the individual is well and no longer in hospital. Uh, we're not saying anything more about the. So there we go. That is the um, that is the infamous. We are not going to talk about the brand or anything. We're not even going to say whether or not if it was cannabis or nicotine, but they spent a whole half an hour uh, talking about vaping and e-cigarettes. And we're using the standard terminology that tobacco control uses about vaping, nicotine vaping, all the time. So after this um, press conference ended, it threw all of Canada's uh, vaping industry into a massive disarray, like huge hit. You pile on what happened in the US and then you took what Dr. Mackey did and sales are down like 20%. And, and when sales are down 20%, that means people are going back to smoking. 
and that and that's happening. Yeah. No, I I would um, you know I, uh, Dr. Mackey may have information that I I wasn't aware of, but I don't think that was a well answered question. It, when the follow up question, if I remember. He did say, yeah, that would be what we do. We'd give out the brands, but I've given that to the chief medical health officer. So um, he sort of admitted that that would be the the best way forward, that people need to be protected from that a particular band, brand or batch or, or, or THC or whatever. So, uh, But that's clearly what we'd, uh, we'd recommend in public health, not just saying, as, and especially as I said before, when we know that the only option for people who are now afraid of vaping uh, would be to take up cigarettes, which is really counterproductive. Right. And, you know, there was a, a lot of back and forth going on with industry because when this happened, I mean, the industry, vaping industry in Canada by and large, right, are very active. I mean, they're regulated. That's the thing that's so disturbing about this. And I'm going to speak on behalf of Regulator Watch here as an organization that seeks to cover regulations and has played a role in this process. We have sat down with Health Canada on three different occasions um, at the director general level talking about the, the regulations back in 2017 as they were being made into law. And then again here this spring when the epidemic had hit. And I said to the director general in April, I, it, it, I, it was striking because there was a whole year there that it felt that Canada was sorted. There was uh, Government came in and said, we're going to regulate and we're going to create a framework. And that framework is going to provide a stable framework in which, you know, vaping is going to get regulated. And it's going to provide access uh, in choice to adults while still protecting kids, right? And yes, yeah. they do have the regulatory abilities to make some tweaks and, and stuff if there's emergencies and this and that. But still, it's this framework. Well, the, it got passed in a law, received royal assent in May of 2018. By August, the epidemic uh, had already been, rhetoric had been going. By September, it was already fully in the news with Dr. David Hammond's, uh, pre, you know, pre-peer-reviewed pre, uh, research. It was already out, and it, you know, CBC was covering it. And by October, it was fully Health Canada was at attention. And then by January, uh, you know, the, the, the whole industry was unraveling. And, and it, was, it was not even a year. It was months after well, you know, as we said, a lot of these, uh, you know, the biggest, uh, you know, advocates for uh, for vaping are really grassroots people. Obviously, they don't want to be selling products that's putting uh, kids in the ICU. Like that's not what they they're not trying to get away with anything. They uh, they want to sell quality products. People who buy them want to have quality products. I don't think there's any question that. Uh, uh, every, it's in everybody's benefit to have regulations, but these regulations have to be based on scientific facts, or at least the best that we know. And uh, and just creating these blanket statements is uh, you know it, it is not the way we should be doing it, and we should be giving people the, the real information. And in this case, clearly, the sooner we could have got to the actual product. And my understanding is that. That what they've released is that the product that that person used in London uh, was purchased online from the United States. So, again, uh, if they've been able to track that down, if it was indeed uh, THC, I'm not sure, but uh, clearly uh, they, that kind of information would have been uh, very helpful. Yeah, and that's the the case here, Dr. Tyndall, is that when when I characterized it as a slow walk. Uh, it definitely was a slow walk release. Um, Dr. Mackey has only just recently um, come out and made that comment that said, he said, incidentally, this product was a product purchased online by this youth. It was not something purchased in a store in Canada. And this is following uh, the week before when industry was asking, begging, uh, Dr. Mackey to release the brand so they could know at least whether or not it was on their shelves. And what uh, Dr. Mackey did was instead of actually releasing the brand, he told industry, he said, send us your inventory list. I'll take a look at your inventory list. And if I see the product there, I'll let you know. And then, of course, well, he knew the whole time that the product couldn't be there 
for all yeah. intents and purposes because he already knew that it was bought from online from the states, right? So it's just so disingenuous. So my question is here is that if there really is a lot of those products in Canada and then in if, with Dr. Mackey, Mackey's issue and then CDC in the states where there's tens and tens of thousands of these tainted products, right? Have the actions that the CDC and Dr. Mackey has taken here in Canada likely caused more harm, more illness, and more death? I, I think that always the best approach is uh, to uh, give people the most uh, relevant information for them. And uh, I do think being more specific is, uh, is, is way better and can help protect people. I mean, um, you know, if it turns out that uh, a lot of this um, is due to bootleg um, uh, THC, um, then it falls back into, um, you know, prohibition. So, we, we, you know, so if, if youth uh, can get vape um, they, and uh, they can, it's easier for them to hide their THC in that. Um, they probably feel, and they're probably right, that it's a safer way to uh, get THC, um, as long as it's not oil-based. Um, you know, it, we really drive people to not trust public health, not trust the message, and uh, and just develop this black market, which would be like a real catastrophe for uh, for vaping, right? Because we we want regulation, and as I say, people want good products, and we don't want to drive this underground to. Uh, you know, um, you know, basement labs that are producing this stuff and uh, and not having any uh, quality control. And as much and that's basically what we've seen with uh, the fentanyl epidemic in in uh, in overdoses. So we've we've allowed the whole system to be go underground and be run by cartels. And uh, that, you know, I, I would hope that wouldn't go that far. But if there are states out there and uh, provinces in Canada who are uh, considering just banning all vape products, that's exactly what, what's going to happen. And that would be, a, again, a, a really catastrophe. So I've got a question. It's, it's, it's a bit strange, but it's out there. It's definitely one of my usual out there ones. But so vaping related lung illness a term I'd never heard before, and we've been covering this issue in depth for four years. Never before I'd heard that. But it was so strikingly familiar, smoking-related illnesses. And I went, oh, so if they are lying, completely lying about vaping-related lung illness, how in the hell can anybody trust them with this smoking related illness because there is no one thing that kills you with smoking that's what they keep saying it's a bunch of different factors together a little less lung cancer a little more heart disease whatever but this is public health and we've just watched them completely totally lie about vaping related, related lung disease so when they talk about smoking related uh disease and death i i'm less inclined to believe them well, I, I think that is a bit out there. I mean, there's been a lot of studies of the pathology of how uh, the chemicals in uh, inhaling tobacco uh, interact cellularly and uh, cause, uh, you know, buildup of lipids and cardiovascular disease. Uh, they do, there's specific uh, toxins that can uh, change cells in the lungs to become cancerous and things. So I, I'm... Yeah, I, sure. I really, I'm really strong. I think we know quite a bit about the pathology sure. uh, and the pathophysiology of uh, what uh, the toxins in tobacco can do. Okay, but but let's just hang that for a second because that's. I mean, I'm not going to completely attack that. But you have to agree they completely lied about uh, secondhand smoke. The data on that was shattered 20 years later, right? I mean, it's just a small. I mean, there's real data, real science out there that says that it did not cause all those heart attacks in Helena. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, again, uh, there's uh, probably um, a linear type of uh, relationship and of exposure. And uh, I think most people would agree that uh, not having any exposure to uh, 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 burned tobacco is a good thing for your, for your health. But um, again, um, 
you know, the idea that walking by somebody on a sidewalk that uh, puts you at risk of getting uh, lung cancer is, uh, you know, over the top. So uh, I, I, I do think that, um, you know, I, I totally, you know, the reason I'm into this is because uh, I think uh, um, smoking tobacco is a bad, bad thing for society. It keeps our healthcare care system uh, going. I mean, that's why it's a bit ironic when um, a lot of uh, respirologists and cardiologists uh, take up the anti-vaping stance. Um, and there's a conflict there. There's a, you know, a respirologist who spends all their time uh, diagnosing lung cancer and COPD. Um, their bread and butter is smoking. Um, I'm not saying they don't wish their patients would stop smoking, but you would think they'd be really on the any kind of safer product for their patients would be something that uh, they'd really jump on the bandwagon. Um, and then again, you know, I think they really, as far as vaping related illness, um, I think um, people really push back that we just don't know, like what does uh, glycerol and propylene glycol and flavors actually do to your lungs. Uh, they're circulating animal studies that show that uh, they can do some damage, um, hasn't been proven in humans. Um, we still have to wait. And I mean, again, um, I'm not going out there and saying that uh, there's absolutely no risk to uh, inhaling this stuff, but uh, certainly compared to uh, combustible tobacco, uh, the risk is, uh, is very small. So, uh, it's a, you know, it, it's really a, a harm reduction argument that we're getting. And that's when, you know, the, um, British is, uh, the British are always, uh, um, quoted as 95% safer and clearly it's, it's, it's way safer. And, uh, and we don't, I don't have to argue that, uh, I support vaping for cigarette smokers uh, because there's absolutely no risk. And I can say 100% that, uh, you know, inhaling blueberry into your lungs is uh, 100% safe. I don't need to go there. I, I think it's, I, I'm not exactly sure. It's probably not totally benign. It seems to be pretty benign, but um, it's really the relative risk that I'm, I'm pointing out that, uh, yeah, go for it. It's way better than what you're doing now. Let me ask you this, and that's great to hear. A lot of people just uh, had a sigh of relief out there uh, in our audience because it's been a while since they've heard stuff like that coming from somebody with your impeccable credentials. Um, on the regulation side in Canada, there are uh, two major consultations that went out. This is all in reaction to the epidemic of teen vaping, and then now, of course, you pile on the, these illnesses that have been attached to it. Um, it's, you know, pretty perilous for the industry. One of the things that's happened is, is that um, when the closed system devices became, you know, went on sale in mass here, so that's the big vape, you know, the stuff that's owned by the tobacco companies and Juul, um, being obviously the most well-known, they hit all the C stores. And so thousands and thousands of stores, and there's all the point of sale advertising uh, that went with it. And that's caused a very big divide with inside vaping because, of course, one side, the open system side, and especially retailer shops, they really see Juul as a company that spoiled things to the best way to put it. And, are, and the f battle is about whether or not to be advocating for no vaping uh, sales in C-Store, um, no advertising, of course, and all that stuff to get cut off. Basically, cut off the big vape uh, and just keep specialty vape. Whereas you've also got a lot of big players that are on the big vape side and you've got the ubiquity that comes with C-Stores. So that increases the access. So if you want to get 5 million more smokers in Canada off of smoking to vaping, you're going to need that access. And then, of course, the flavors. What are your thoughts on this? I mean, how, how does this circle get squared? Because the vaping industry itself is divided over. Yeah. No, I think um, I, I think. I mean, we have natural experiments in Canada. So uh, Ontario had a much more uh, aggressive uh, sort of uh, advertising of these and, and uh, easy access. Uh, British Columbia didn't really have that um, at the same extent. Um, so I, I do think we can um, make these products accessible and, um, you know, attractive to smokers. Um, in, in various ways. Um, 
without having kind of in your face advertisements in uh, in convenience stores. I, I do think there's ways to uh, you know to to make it uh, convenient and accessible that uh, doesn't require having uh, you know vaping advertisements at every gas station and things like that. So I think there is a because it, you know the trade off is that everybody sees that, including youth and people that. Uh, um, you know, you know, we don't really um, encourage the access to. So, um, it, you know, we have to catch get, get a, a fine balance there. Um, so, I do think there should be some uh, some restrictions on vaping, and certainly lifestyle kind of uh, advertisements and things should uh, uh, should be tightly regulated. Um, uh, but I, you know, I, I do think there's a we just need to hit a sweet spot. We can't make it. Uh, difficult for people to access these at the same time um and we need to uh um you know j just strike a balance there i think just strike a balance that's 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 the government's line that they used when they uh were bringing in the regulations and the industry bought that line so yeah. i think that i put this out here is that uh, unlike any other country specifically north america right is that canada's made these products legal so at some point, you know, where's Health Canada in this process? They should be standing up for their science. They should be standing up for their process. The government of Canada spent years evaluating this product. Yeah. They, they deemed it safe. They passed laws, passed regulations, and then put it out there. And now what's happening is pressure groups are, are pressuring them. And the chances are they're <coughs> going to back away. And when they do that, they need, uh, they're basically essentially saying they got the science wrong. Yeah, well, I, th I do think that, you know, this uh, this youth vaping uh, thing has uh, been a little unexpected um, as far as the prevalence goes. And uh, certainly all this uh, all these uh, deaths and disease in the United States has really uh, um, made uh, made these regulations a little uh, made the government a little skittish about this. Um, I, you know, I try to always bring the conversation back to the five million people that are uh, could benefit from this product. So uh, that that needs to be our uh, that needs to be our target, um, and getting good information out to people, making it available to people, um, getting more a better science, and following up people who are, who are vaping to make the case stronger is is also important. So there there's really two issues to me here that um, it's such an important public health intervention that we need to. Uh, be making sure that um, people who can benefit get it, um, but at the same time we uh, we're cognizant of the fact we don't want to, you know, create a lot more nicotine addiction among young people. Right. It, it, you know, the fascinating thing to me too is people, the most likely people that will start cigarette smoking are as if your parents or relatives or somebody close to you smoke cigarettes. So cigarette smoking tends to run in families. You know, my a lot of people that I know who smoke, my parents smoked. I mean, that that was kind of how people started. And so if we got the message out there to, that, uh, you know, my parents don't smoke anymore, they turn to vaping. I mean, it, it's a, it sends a strong message to, to the youth and people around that uh, smoking is dangerous and, and bad for my health. And uh, I need to do something else if I'm going to use nicotine. So right. uh, they're, they're connect. They're, we need to separate those two issues, youth vaping and, uh, and smoking vaping is somewhat, but they are tied together because why people start smoking is often because of the what they see in front of them, and and usually that's parents and aunts and uncles. Right. The thing is that Dr. Tyndall, just a point I'm going to make is that I believe that you're 100 percent right there, and most tobacco controllers and anti vapers know that, and that's why they don't want to see a bunch of adults vaping because they know that will normalize vaping for their kids, right? So if you're going to convert 5 million smokers over to vaping, that's 5 million vapors. And then all of them are going to normalize that for those, the youth that, you know, that are in their lives. And then that's your next generation of vape users, right? So what they're trying to do is they're trying to kind of break that wedge. They're trying to, they're trying to use these measures to, to stop that progression, right? From happening. Yeah. So, I guess, but I mean, the reality is that uh, um, that's um, is a familial thing for a lot of people. Sure, so, uh, yeah, no, <laughs> sure it is, sure it is. So, uh, no doubt. Um, before we um, head off and wrap up, I just want to let our viewers know uh, to head over to support.regulatorwatch.com and our new support website. 
there you can dig into your pocket and uh, pick your own little monthly contribution to RegWatch, which we absolutely do need you to support RegWatch because we you know, produce great coverage. And I won't be around without viewer support and industry support. So please do head over to support.regulatorwatch.com and uh, sign up for a monthly contribution today. So, Dr. Tyndall, thank you so much for joining us today on RegWatch. Final word for you, my friend. No, I, um, you know, I want to, I'm not an, I, I always want to position myself, my uh, constituency, the people I want to advocate for, are those who could benefit from these products and uh, that we really need to uh, get the truth out there for people and uh, really position this as a, a safer product um, and really build in, um, you know, uh, good regulations that make sure people get the best possible uh, um best possible devices and best possible e-liquids. Well, that's great. Well, thank okay. you very much, Dr. Tyndall. Okay. And that's it for this edition of RegWatch. I'd like to thank you all for watching. And before you head off, please definitely go over to support.regulatorwatch.com and make that monthly contribution. And don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. For regulatorwatch.com, I'm Brent Stafford. See ya. See ya. Okay.